welcome everybody. My name's Maya Van Rossum. I'm the Delaware Riverkeeper, also leader of the fourth, fourth state organization, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and a founding member of the Voices Coalition. And it is the Voices Coalition that has organized and is putting on this congressional briefing focused on the issue of Natural Gas Act reform. For those who don't know about Voices, we were founded in 2012. And at this point, we have over 250 grassroots community and env environmental organizations in 35 states that are battling against FERC regulated frac gas infrastructure and experiencing the many abuses of power that um, is common when it comes to dealing with FERC. Today, we have identified and are going to be putting forth 10 Natural Gas Act reforms that we think are essential for transforming FERC from an abusive arm of the pipeline companies to a government agency that is truly serving the people of our nation and that will provide genuine and meaningful protection for our communities, our environment, climate, businesses, property rights, as well as states' rights. Now, while I said we identified and are putting forth 10 reforms as part of this briefing. In fact, during the, the hour of the briefing, we're only going to highlight seven of those critical reforms, but all 10, including a, a, a brief detailed analysis of what needs to be reformed in the Natural Gas Act, as well as the rationale for those reforms, they're all gonna be included in this PowerPoint that will be shared with you after the briefing. But during this one hour, we are gonna take the opportunity to just identify seven critical reforms, um, each for which we have a testifier that's working on the front lines and is really going to be able to demonstrate for you through re real world examples why that particular critical reform to the Natural Gas Act is essential for protecting communities, our environment, and restoring equity to the FERC review and approval process. In addition to the PowerPoint that um, after the briefing, there will also be some additional materials that will be provided to help you fully understand the reforms that we're seeking and why they're so essential. And I just wanna also highlight that um, the Voices Coalition has a standing offer for all members of Congress and really a standing request um, to have an opportunity for Voices leaders to meet with congressional offices to discuss our experiences with FERC and how they abuse communities and the process and to talk about the Natural Gas Act reforms that we have identified. If you'd like to schedule a meeting with Voices leaders, you can get in touch with me. Again, Maya Van Rossum, my contact information is there, or with Karen Faridin from Burke's Gas Truth, who is also a founding member of the Voices Coalition, and her information is also provided. So now we're gonna jump in and really to help give us the lay of the land and understand what is happening at FERC and why reforms are so essential. We are honored to be joined by Congressman Jamie Raskin, who has been really a leader when it comes to investigating FERC's abuses and identifying needed reforms. With that, I'm gonna stop my screen share and turn it over to Congressman Raskin. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, Maya, thank you so much uh, for your great activism and your great hard work, and thanks to the, uh, the whole coalition, the Voices Coalition, for uh, hosting this briefing and including me in it. Uh, you know that I am the chair of the House Oversight Committee Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. In that capacity, uh, I was receiving continuing reports from people that the FERC process uh, was allowing natural gas companies to abuse the rights of landowners and farmers who live along proposed uh, pipeline routes. So I decided to investigate this and to dig deeper into the issues that we were hearing about related to FERC. And what we found, frankly, uh, shocked and appalled me, uh, we began our investigations into FERC last February with a letter focused on FERC's alleged failure to protect uh, landowner rights in the eminent domain process. And so as a result of that uh, inquiry, we learned that FERC rubber stamps pipeline projects approving certificate applications by companies at a rate greater than 99% of the 1,021 certificate requests that FERC got between 1999 and 2020, it rejected only six of them. 
<laughs> okay? So it is almost impossible for one of the natural gas companies to lose before FERC. Um, these certificates grant the companies the ability to use eminent domain to take land away from private landowners. Uh, and if you wanna defend your land against such a taking, uh, you have to first affirmatively intervene into the FERC proceeding for that project and then challenge the certificate order by requesting a rehearing from FERC. And if you fail to intervene, then you could be barred from ever protecting your land in federal court. So the, it's like uh, the system is set up to take your land away from you. And that's a perversion of how due process should work in America relating to people's own property rights. You should not have to affirmatively opt in to a process when a company is trying to take your land away from you. Um, so after you submit a hearing request, the Natural Gas Act requires that FERC respond to you within 30 days. Um, historically though, FERC would respond to these rehearing requests with something called tolling orders. And we learned that between 2008 and 2020, FERC responded to every single landowner request with a tolling order only to eventually deny it. So the tolling order just put the whole process on hold. And we learned that on average 212 days, about seven months passed between the time a landowner requested one of these rehearings before it was eventually denied. And while landowners were being held in limbo by these tolling orders, the pipeline company could assert eminent domain, take their land and even begin ravaging and destroying the land through construction. For example, between 08 and 2020, FERC received 114 requests for rehearing. In 73 of those cases, or 64%, FERC authorized construction of the pipelines before ever ruling on the rehearing request. FERC's practice of responding to landowners' rehearing requests with tolling orders created a complete lack of due process for landowners in their fight just to protect their land, their private property. Fortunately, FERC's use of tolling orders was overturned last June by the DC Circuit Court of Appeals in an opinion that cited uh, numerous findings of our subcommittee. And I was very pleased with the DC Circuit's decision as it was a crucial first step in understanding this issue and increasing protections of fundamental rights for landowners. I was proud to see the court cite our findings uh, in its ruling, and I'm grateful for all the lawyers and the landowners who worked so hard for that outcome just to defend their basic rights in the process. But our findings from that first letter were just the beginning in understanding the thorough bias which permeates FERC's process, always prioritizing pipeline construction and profit over the rights of people. Because of our work on FERC, my office has now been inundated with calls from land, landowners along the pathway of Chenier Energy's midship pipeline in Oklahoma. From those calls, we have learned that FERC's abuses of landowners continue way past construction into the so-called restoration phase. FERC routinely allows pipelines to go into service prior to repairing the damage that they've caused on landowners' property. Um, this means, forgive me, I think I... Uh, this means that the pipeline companies can start selling their gas and turning a profit while landowners continue to suffer from the damage that they've caused. This FERC practice disincentivizes quick repair by the companies. A natural gas company's main goal is to profit from the sale of gas. So once it's able to do that, it no longer has any real motivation to complete the restoration of people's land that's been chewed up by the construction process. Yesterday, my subcommittee released a new video report featuring Oklahoma farmers who live along the path of Chenier's midship pipeline. I was outraged to hear from them that Chenier promised to repair their property by June 30th of last year, 2020. But now 10 months later, those farmers are still waiting for their property to be repaired. I encourage you to watch that report if you've not already and tune in for our hearing tomorrow where I will be seeking answers directly from Chenier. After learning about these further abuses, we sent another letter to FERC 
and brought them in for a hearing at the end of last year to get answers directly from the source about what FERC could be doing to better protect landowners and what still requires legislative action on our part in Congress. In that hearing, FERC admitted that it had authorities available to them now to protect landowners that it was not utilizing. For example, FERC could add a condition to its certificate orders that require companies to return unused land to its owners when a pipeline project is canceled, but it doesn't do that. Additionally, following the DC Circuit's decision last June, then FERC Chairman Neil Chatterjee and current Chairman Richard Glick issued a joint statement asking for Congress to consider amending the Natural Gas Act to quote, make clear that the commission should be prohibited from allowing construction in eminent domain while rehearing requests were pending. At our hearing, FERC admitted that it already has the authority it needs to suspend its certificates and prevent both of those things without any further action from Congress. However, we will not wait on FERC to decide to make these necessary changes. These issues at FERC demand immediate reform. It is unacceptable that a federal agency that's supposed to be working for the common good of the people, such as FERC, would prioritize the agendas and the profits of private companies over the rights of American citizen landowners. I am committed to addressing these issues through continued aggressive oversight of FERC and through legislative reform where we believe we can intervene in a positive way. Thank you again for inviting me to kick off this important briefing and I look forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers as long as I can stay. I appreciate it, uh, Amaya, and I yield back to you. Thank you so much, Congressman Raskin, for really giving us the lay of the land and highlighting how essential it is for Congress to get involved through Natural Gas Act reforms. I do just want to um, let folks know, which I forgot to say at the beginning, we are going to be doing Q&A at the end, so using the Q&A feature, so feel free to line up your questions. Um, but now let's just jump right in. Um, so the, the first critical Natural Gas Act reform that the Voices Coalition would like to, to see happen is a reform to FERC's mission. Um, FERC's mission needs to be updated to ensure a clear focus on the public interest, including future generations, and ensuring a priority focus on protecting the health and safety of people, environmental protection, including the climate crisis, protecting people's rights, states' rights, and property rights, um, and ensuring that they are given priority over the interests of industry, as well as a pathway for advancing clean and renewable energy alternatives. Um, there are lots of reasons for this reform, and we're going to hear from Dr. Irene Leach, Associate Professor of Consumer Studies at Virginia Tech, and active on the front lines in her community to help identify why this reform to the Natural Gas Act is so critical. Irene? So... With my concern about the mission, I went to the library uh, and found the first two reports for FERC. Uh, and as I look through them, uh, I found that in those years, there was a lot of emphasis on protecting consumers and that even being uh, the ultimate goal of the regulation that FERC provided. Uh, and where getting information to consumers was really important. You see here pictures uh, of the area uh, within the agency that they had set up so that consumers could get information that we need. Uh, and at the end of the first year, they also uh, set up the sunshine policies to make sure that information was available. In the second year, uh, the report opens uh, with an introduction that emphasizes uh, that the responsibilities uh, of carrying out that regulatory work uh, is to ensure that consumers are charged fair and reasonable rates and uh, supporting the policy goals of expanding domestic energy, use of renewables, and conservation. Uh, over time, the focus has really come to the domestic energy supplies, particularly fossil fuels. Commission meetings 
uh, were originally set up with real concern for how the public could participate uh, and understand what was going on. Uh, the regional hearings were designed to hear from people so that what people thought could be used to influence uh, the decisions. Uh, and again, it says in the report multiple times, the primary goal is to protect the public interest and strike a balance between consumers and the industry. And since the Office of Public Participation was called for in 78, but uh, is only just now getting set up, in those early days, the reports put a lot of emphasis on a consumer affairs program and outreach to communities and consumers uh, and in paying attention to what the people were asking for. Today, when you look at the web page for FERC, uh, yes, finally, the Office of Public Participation, but notice that the tagline says, FERC ensures economically efficient, safe, reliable, and secure energy for consumers. It doesn't say anything about involving consumers. It doesn't mention environmental justice or renewables uh, or anything else. Uh, and as one who has been participating in its processes, uh, the most recent public hearing that I attended that was led by FERC uh, looked like this. Uh, this is in Farmville, Virginia. Uh, and this was a public hearing. This is how it's set up. Uh, and this is where I gave my testimony in a private room uh, with a court reporter and one FERC representative. I don't call this active involvement. Citizens don't feel that we're being heard. Uh, and you already heard from the congressman uh, about the approval rates and so forth. Uh, and if you look at the agenda, you'll see that regularly FERC has workshops and other kinds of interaction with the industry, but not the same with consumers. Uh, a current research study that's underway, uh, led by Dr. Shannon uh, Bell at Virginia Tech, asked how satisfied consumers were with the information that they got about property rights. And here you can see how the vast majority are very dissatisfied uh, with how that goes. Consumers and landowners have gotten accustomed to reports that say projects will result in some adverse and significant impacts, but they'll be reduced to acceptable levels. Uh, and also we find that the benefits outweigh uh, the adverse effects. Uh, this is standard language. What you see is that landowners are not feeling that FERC is working in our interest. The signs uh, on this run from uh, along the Mountain Valley pipeline just Saturday uh, have been used over years, pointing out that FERC is a rubber stamp and that it's not looking at the things that we care about. We hope that Congress will review this mission of FERC. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leach. That was so helpful um, for identifying why the Natural Gas Act needs mission reform for FERC. The Critical Natural Gas Act Reform Number 2 that has been identified by the Voices Coalition is we believe that the Natural Gas Act Section 7 must specifically and clearly define the term public convenience and necessity to require priority protection for our environment, environmental justice, our health, our safety, and our climate, and to require demonstration of an ob objectively verifiable domestic need. Um, we are going to now hear from Barbara Exum of Wilson County No Pipeline about why this reform is so essential, particularly from an environmental justice perspective. 
My name is Barbara Exum. I'm from Wilson, North Carolina. My question is, is the mission of FERC to function as an agent of the gas companies with an objective to, to establish an administrative quagmire that puts us landowners in a chokehold until it forces us to hand over our land rights to the gas companies. Based on my experience with FERC and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, I believe the answer to this question is yes. The lines between FERC and the gas companies were so blurred, it was hard to tell who was running the show, even at the so-called FERC hearings. My four siblings and I own a small farm in Wilson County, North Carolina. This farm has been in our family for over a hundred years. At various points in our lives, my ancestors, my parents, my siblings and I have all worked on this farm in order to, to earn a living and educate our families. Just like a businessman would work hard to build his company to provide for his family. This is a minority community because in the 1970s, it was very difficult for African Americans to buy property to build homes. Very difficult. And I don't need to explain that fact. Because of this, my parents made the decision to sell lots on our farm so that young black families could also have the opportunity to achieve the American dream of home ownership, just like everybody else. Now, 50 years later, these young black families are now senior citizens, most of them caring for either their elderly parents, a spouse, or even grandchildren. Our community is not opposed to progress or change for the greater good, but not when it comes at the harm of our environment or our community or our very lives for the financial gain of others. And especially when there are alternatives that are environmentally safer energy alternatives that will truly benefit us, benefit us all and not just the gas companies and their stockholders. There are federal government agencies with the mission of protecting wildlife, fish, game, other endangered species against environmental predators. So my question is, which federal agency is charged with protecting us humans against the predatory practices of the gas companies? The path of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline was not a direct path from West Virginia to North Carolina. The path looked more like a gerrymandered political district. It snaked its way through North Carolina and miraculously found some of the poorer counties and communities, essentially communities least capable of fighting back. Unlike the gas companies, we don't have an army of lawyers and land agents working on our behalf, planning and strategizing for years to help safeguard us from the threat of imminent domain by the gas companies. When we learned about ACP's plan to seize our land rights, the FERC clock had already started its countdown for us. So right away and with little warning, we felt like we were fighting two enemies, FERC and the gas companies, both with the goal of taking our land rights and armed with the threat of eminent domain. For a senior citizen or anyone, the mere threat of losing your lifelong home takes an immeasurable toll on your spirit, as well as your physical being. And this is already a vulnerable community. We're simple people. We live simple lives. We work hard and try to provide for our families, just like businessmen working hard for their, to build their companies. 
Great. So I want to thank Barbara for giving us that um, that video testimony. And I do just want to reiterate for those who have joined us um, since we began the presentation, you're going to see a lot of text on these PowerPoint slides, but that's really, these are a summary of the reforms that we're seeking and then a summary of the rationale. I'm just highlighting a few pieces, but we will be providing this, this PowerPoint information to everybody and making it publicly available. But we really want to focus on highlighting the reforms and letting our testifiers make the case for why the reform is needed. So just want to confirm that for folks. So critical natural gas act reform number three is we believe that the natural gas act has to provide language to fully respect and protect states rights and authorities when it comes to issuing clean water act section 401 certification. The Natural Gas Act needs to clarify that state 401 certifications have primacy over FERC certifications and to clearly prohibit FERC from granting a certificate of public convenience and necessity until such time as all state Clean Water Act certifications have been received. It also needs to be reformed to clarify that any time limit on 401 certification reviews by the states, the clock only starts to tick when the state has determined that the application submitted for that certification is complete and in compliance with state law. Not just any old piece of information or any old piece of paper or body of information is enough to start that clock ticking. The, the state has to make a determination of compliance. And also we need the Natural Gas Act to make clear that state authority is under 401 certification is only waived when the state renders an affirmative decision. Um, if there is going to be a 401 certification review timeframe and the deadline is not met by the state, the presumption should be that the certi certification has been denied, not that the state has waived its 401 certification authority. Um, our testifier to make the case for this critical reform is Megan Holleran, a landowner and business owner who has been impacted by the Constitution pipeline. So hi, my name is Megan Holleran and I'm from New Milford, Pennsylvania. Uh, my family has owned a 23 acre property here since the 1950s where my grandparents lived and my mother and her siblings grew up. Now my aunt lives on the property. Our extended family still gathers there pretty frequently and we use the land to produce hay for my uncle's farm and to make maple syrup as a part of my family's small business, North Hartford Maple. In 2012, we were approached by the Constitution Pipeline Company seeking to route their project through our land. However, my family decided not to sign an easement agreement. Instead, after being granted a certificate of public convenience and necessity by FERC, the company was able to use eminent domain to acquire their easements. A federal judge decided to use the quick take process to grant the company access to and possession of our easement on our land immediately, prior to any compensation being provided to us. Then in 2016, FERC granted the company the right to begin pre-construction of the pipeline, which let them start cutting trees in the right of way. At that time, the project had not yet received all of the New York state permits necessary to build the pipeline, including the 401 water quality certificate, but FERC allowed tree cutting in Pennsylvania anyway. So our biggest fear at that point was that our forest would be destroyed and then the project would be canceled. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. Hundreds of our trees were cut down, including maple trees, which we'd been using to make maple syrup. The judge had also granted the company the use of US marshals at that time to enforce their ownership. So on the days when the trees were being cut, the crews were accompanied by about a dozen fully armed US Marshals, preventing anyone from coming within 150 feet of the right of way. And then about a month later, the 401 water quality certificate in New York state was denied. So without that permit, the project couldn't proceed and eventually the entire thing was canceled. It was, it was every bit as horrible as we had imagined. The right of way had been cleared, but the, pub, the pipeline would never be built. So after several years of uncertainty about what would happen to the right of way, uh, the last year the ownership of the land was finally returned to my family and we reached a settlement for compensation, which included a non-disclosure agreement, which somewhat limits what I'm able to say here today. But um, we, were, we were thrilled to get our land back and to know that we won't be forced to live with a permanent pipeline easement, which we never really wanted in the first place. However, the damage has already been done. We've 
been able to begin replanting trees, but even within my lifetime, we'll never be able to replace what was lost. I'll never be able to make maple syrup from those trees again. Our forest will never be the same as it was, and our home will never be the same. In our case, FERC's decision to grant the pipeline company the power to seize our land through eminent domain, the judge's decision to grant immediate possession of that land, and then FERC's decision to allow tree cutting prior to the New York State 401 water quality certificate being issued resulted in irreversible and ultimately completely unnecessary damage. Granting a pipeline company the power to take land and begin altering it prior to being certain that a project has all of the necessary permits and truly in the public interest is unfair and harmful to landowners. I cannot overstate how mentally and emotionally damaging this has been for my family. Throughout the whole process, we've felt powerless. It was horrifying and heartbreaking to watch such permanent and ultimately such pointless damage being done to our land and having no way to prevent it. It was devastating to watch 100 year old trees fall knowing they can't be replaced. And it was really scary having armed soldiers take over our land and make us feel like we were the ones who didn't belong there. But it is our hope that by sharing our experience, we may be able to inspire reforms to the Natural Gas Act and to the FERC process as a whole, which would prevent other landowners from having to go through a similar experience in the future. In that light, I am so grateful for the opportunity to speak here today and to share my story with you. And thank you so much for listening. Back to you, Maya. Thank you so much, Megan, for clearly making the case why this Natural Gas Act critical reform is so essential. So um, critical Natural Gas Act reform number four is to prohibit FERC from allowing companies to proceed with eminent domain property rights takings or any element of construction, including tree felling, until such time as all state, federal, and or interstate reviews, certifications, permits, and dockets have been finalized and have been granted. And to help um, to help provide for us a frontline story as to why this critical reform is so essential, we're going to hear from Maury Johnson, a farmer, resident, and landowner that's impacted by the Mountain Valley and Atlantic Coast pipelines. Maury? Thank you. And thank you, uh, Congressman Raskins and members of Congress and staff and others who are watching this briefing. My name is Maury Johnson. I live in Southeastern West Virginia. I'm a member of Preserve Monroe and the Power Coalition, which stands for Protect Our Water Rights and Heritage. I'm also a member of a number of other uh, organizations fighting the Mountain Valley and the now Council's uh, Atlantic Coast Pipeline. We're landowners and citizens devoted to opposing these pipelines in West Virginia, North Carolina, and Virginia. My family's multi-generational organic farm is in the path of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which is currently trying to be built across West Virginia and Southwestern Virginia. They first started physical construction in March of 2018 and, and halted work on my farm in July of 2018 after losing the nationwide 12 permit to cross streams and wetlands. They begin again in September of 2018 after receiving permission from FERC to resume work, work on non-water related areas. They stopped again on my farm in February 2019 and haven't been back. There still needs to do a lot of work on my farm, including crossing a water feature. At present time, it doesn't appear that that will happen until next year, if ever. Meanwhile, I have lost the use of the most productive part of the farm and have many other problems from the construction like increased turbidity in my household well due to groundwater contamination from building through a karst area where I live. My aunt and uncle who live nearby also have moderate to profound turbidity in their well and like me have to carry or buy water from another source for drinking, cooking and other special other personal needs. We both have concerns that if further construction occurs across the karst area on my farm, my family's farm, that we could lose the water on one or both of our farms, water necessary for our homes and farms. This is not uncommon for pipeline construction. As of today, this morning, there was an announcement that MVP is nearly double its original project cost. It is now projected to cost $6.2 billion and the cost continues to increase. It is now not projected to be completed until at least 2022, which I doubt because they are lacking numerous permits. They may never get those permits. If they do, it'll be late next year. 
The fact that this project is so over budget and years behind schedule is exactly why pipeline companies should never be allowed to use eminent domain to build a project before they have all the necessary permits for the project and those per permits are securely vetted and are secure. The MVP was first proposed in 2015. It was promoted, permitted in 2017. Many of these permits were flawed as demonstrated by the court challenges, the many court challenges filed in federal district court. In vacating one of the MVP permits, Chief Judge Roger Gregory of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond stated that it appeared that the United States Forest Service had capitulated, and he said capitulated, to the pipeline company in issuing the permit allowing them to cross the Jefferson National Forest. The same scenario has, has played out numerous times, not only in the MVP, but also on the recently canceled ACP or the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. The MVP has lost several key, key permits, but continues to try to construct while those permits are being challenged. They are now trying to construct while several court challenges, including one recently uh, lost permit to, uh, on the water crossings has been vacated. Meanwhile, the company has taken hundreds of people to court seeking eminent domain and to take this power and severely impact the private property. Nevertheless, the pipelines such as the MVP, ACP, Constitution, and others have been allowed to use eminent domain to take property and begin construction years before the people who are impacted have a court trial to determine what should be just compensation or if the pipeline would ever be built. Finally, as Thomas Jefferson asserted many times, private property rights are the fundamental backbone of our democracy. Congress must return fairness and protection to landowners in any reforms they seek. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maury. That was really poignant and helpful. Um, so Critical Natural Gas Act Reform Number 4, identified by the Voices Coalition, is to mandate meaningful consideration of climate change in the FERC review, decision-making, and certification analysis and process. Um, we need the, man, the Natural Gas Act to mandate consideration of all the climate changing impacts of a proposed pipeline project, from the extraction of the gas to the storage to the transportation and to the end uses of the natural gas that will be carried by the infrastructure that's being proposed. And we need the Natural Gas Act to make very clear that a project is not deemed to serve the public convenience and necessity if it is demonstrated that emissions will result in a net increase in climate, climate changing emissions over current levels. To help us understand why this is so important, we're gonna hear from Adam Carlesco, staff attorney with the Climate and Energy Pro Program at Food and Water Watch. Adam? Good afternoon, uh, my name is Adam Carlesco, staff attorney at Food and Water Watch, as Maya mentioned. Uh, and I wanted to thank all the congressional staff and members, including my own representative, Jamie Raskin here in Silver Spring, uh, for taking the time to consider the reforms necessary uh, to move our energy systems towards a cleaner future. Uh, one of the biggest problems that I've encountered in some of the litigation that we've been engaging with within, with FERC is that uh, despite DC Circuit precedent uh, surrounding Zabal Trail in the 2017 case, uh, FERC is largely disregarding downstream and upstream emissions coming off of uh, the gas pipelines that are infrastructure that are being installed. Uh, so when they refuse to take this uh, full assessment of indirect impacts, they're failing to look at upstream and downstream uh, impacts. So uh, not looking at the incentivization of uh, further extraction of natural gas through uh, fracking within the Marcellus Shale, for instance, uh, or the downstream impacts of uh, increasing capacity uh, of gas that's flowing into a local distribution network that might be impacting an environmental justice community. These sorts of things are too often falling outside of the scope of uh, FERC's review and uh, therefore kind of get completely disregarded when assessing whether or not a project is of the public necessity or convenience. Uh, additionally, when they are calculating greenhouse gas emissions, they're largely neglecting anything outside of on-site construction and operations. So namely trucks that are being moved into the site uh, to install pipeline and the operation of a single compressor station unit. Uh, it's essentially just a large jet engine. Uh, and as such, they don't actually look at the full heft of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are coming off of the project, specifically, you know, in downstream combustion outside of the scope of uh, the very narrow uh, power, direct power plant pipeline a standard that was established in uh, Sierra Club v. FERC in 2017 at the DC Circuit. Um, moreover, when they're looking at these greenhouse gas emissions, they are doing more or less no significance analysis, uh, despite uh, the National Environmental Policy Act requiring this. Uh, we've seen a slight change in FERC's policy as it goes on, uh, but what they're doing is really comparing 
the construction volumes towards a national inventory. And when you're taking a singular project and comparing it against the greenhouse gases of uh, essentially one of the largest gas producing countries in the nation, in the, in the world, uh, they're failing to look at uh, the, the real heft and weight of the climate impact these projects are having. Um, additionally, when FERC is trying to deal with um, three hearing requests that are coming off of individuals, while well, they, the, as Representative Raskin mentioned uh, with the case of the DC circuit that uh, halted tolling orders, they're now issuing uh, kind of non-denial denials, uh, it, essentially right out the gate denying rehearing orders, uh, yet leaving the decision open uh, to be changed at a future date. This leaves potential litigants in limbo and allows FERC to kind of moot these challenges down the road uh, by granting a rehearing. Um, and in conclusion, Congress needs to make reforms to the Natural Gas Act. Uh, FERC's organizational mission is sorely outdated and still reeks in the 1930s when the Natural Gas Act was uh, instituted. And uh, the commission needs to be focused on facilitating a transition to carbon-free energy sources uh, and kind of looking to review all gas infrastructure uh, in the light that there's going to be gradual retirement and decommissioning of fossil fuel sources uh, over the coming years. Uh, and this needs to be a priority for us to hit any sort of United Nations, IPCC, climate benchmarks necessary to preserve a stable climate. Uh, and I look forward to working with any members and staff of Congress as to how they might go about doing so. And I thank you for your time. Um, so, but um, we're just going to skip ahead because we are really honored to be joined by Congresswoman Nanette Berrigan, who has also been a real champion when it comes to FERC reform, um, and particularly ensuring a much needed focus on issues of environmental justice. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Congresswoman Berrigan. Well, thank you, Maya, uh, for that introduction. It's so great to be with the Voices Coalition today to discuss environmental justice impacts of FERC and the reforms that will make a meaningful difference. Environmental justice is a top priority for me and my community. Uh, my community here in South Los Angeles is surrounded by three freeways the, uh, and the port where you have extraction, you have uh, refining and burning of fossil fuels and at some of the highest levels of air pollution in the country. Tragically, my constituents also have some of the highest rates of respiratory diseases and cancers. So I believe this is a public health crisis and it's been made worse uh, by COVID-19. It's unacceptable, um, but it's far too common for African-American, Latino, indigenous and low-income communities around the country. So for many years, FERC has been part of the problem. It has ignored, ignored, uh, the climate and environmental justice aspects of fossil fuel projects under its review. It's been a rubber stamp of approval for natural gas pipelines and liquefied natural gas terminals. Now, as the Biden administration and Congress work to hold polluters accountable and invest in environmental justice communities, it's critical that we avoid doing more harm by permitting more fossil fuel infrastructure in these communities. I'll tell you how heartbreaking it is when you walk around and you talk to folks and you see kids that walk around with inhalers around their necks, just playing in the park. Um, and so this is a critically important for me. Now, the efforts by FERC Chairman Richard Glick to improve FERC's review of proposed projects uh, so they consider climate and environmental justice impacts are a good first step. However, we need this to lead to better decisions by FERC. You know, projects incompatible with the U.S. climate goals or, um, or harmful uh, to the public health of disadvantaged communities should not move forward. We also need to make sure uh, that the change, um, that we change the law uh, to ensure that FERC cannot disregard these impacts if a new chair is appointed in the future. Uh, implementing environmental justice and climate standards into FERC's project reviews is a critical of an all of government approach to tackle environmental injustice and the climate crisis. Um, so by lifting up the voices of frontline communities and the climate crisis, rather by lifting up the, the, the voices of our communities, um, of frontline communities, we're helping to ensure 
that reforms are part of the conversation. So consider me a partner, a partner in the fight for meaningful change at FERC and the partner in making sure we're giving a voice to our communities and those who um, sometimes may be afraid to come forward. So it was, I was glad to get on a little early to hear from so, some of those directly impacted uh, because this is about working together as a coalition, those on the ground, those in the halls of Congress, local government, but it's our voices that are gonna make that change. And so I'm very excited about um, your uh, briefing here today and being part of that. Uh, with that, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. That was really powerful. And um, to just really, again, highlights why Natural Gas Act reform by members of Congress under the leadership of yourself and Congressman Raskin is so vitally, vitally important. Um, so yeah. now we are gonna go forward and um, hit on natural, critical Natural Gas Act reform number six. Um, which is that we need the Natural Gas Act to mandate a genuine demonstration of domestic need for the gas to be transported in order to secure public convenience and necessity certification, including um, the Natural Gas Act has to ensure to get certification from FERC that there is proof of domestic need that is based on an independently verified demonstration of need, requiring that the needs claim be based on users unaffiliated with the project sponsors themselves and a demonstration that the energy need asserted by the applicants cannot be fulfilled by re renewable energy options. Um, and to talk about why this critical reform is so important, we're gonna hear from Mike Spiel, a resident of West Amwell, New Jersey, chairman of the West Amwell Environmental Commission and an impacted landowner from the proposed Penny's Pipeline Project. Mike? Thanks, Maya. So I'm going to uh, share a little presentation on this. Uh, so as Maya said, my name is Mike Spilly. Uh, I am a resident of New Jersey and impacted uh, landowner from the Penny's Pipeline. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. So today I'm speaking to serious issues with FERC, the Natural Gas Act, and we'll use the Penny's Pipeline project as an example of those issues. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about first, FERC's written policies regarding permitting of interstate natural gas pipelines, the actual policies that FERC is following, which is quite different from what the regulations say. Use the Penny's Pipeline is one example of FERC policies gone wrong. And finally, I'll show how the Natural Gas Act is an enabler of bad behavior by FERC and pipeline companies. So first, let's go to the written policy. So FERC's current policy claims to prevent against overbuilding, prevent unnecessary disruption of the environment, and to guard against unneeded exercise of eminent domain. Some critical aspects of this policy include First, pipeline companies are supposed to work to minimize impacts to landowners and communities. FERC is supposed to weigh the purported benefit of a project against its negative impacts. Critically, only if specific benefits of a project outweigh the out adverse effects should FERC approve a project. And on benefits, FERC's policies ask that pipeline companies show as much proof of public benefit as they can. And under this policy, the larger the impacts a project, project has, the greater the proof of benefit the company would have to show. So that's the written policy, but what's the actual policy of FERC? In, in reality, FERC doesn't do any balancing of adverse effects versus public benefit. They say it in their certificate orders, but they don't actually do it. They threw that practice away long ago. They do not care about community impacts. And when it comes to eminent domain, they do not even know what properties might be condemned by a project and which would not be. FERC only requires minimal proof of need, just shipping agreements, and they allow contracts with subsidiaries as proof. In addition to all this, FERC guarantees pipeline certificate holders up to a 14% rate of return on construction costs. This high rate encourages unnecessary infra infrastructure projects over and over again. These bad behaviors are enabled by the lack of definition of public convenience and necessity in the Natural Gas Act. So the NGA, it, it, it says that basically, if a project is required by the future or public convenience and necessity, then it can be approved by FERC. And if it doesn't, it will be denied. However, critically, the NGA does not define what that means. This allows FERC to create their own interpretation that favors industry and in turn encourages rampant overbuilding of natural gas infrastructure. In many cases, this also allows FERC to call contracts 
between pipeline companies and their own affiliated companies as proof of public convenience and necessity with no other proof needed. This enables FERC to grant eminent domain rights to private companies without any proof of public benefit. So I'm gonna talk a little bit just about Penn East as an example. So Penn East is a Greenfield 115 mile long natural gas pipeline that was proposed by local nat natural gas distribution companies or LDCs in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So today the LDCs that own Penn East get natural gas from other existing third party pipelines and the money the captive rate payers pay for their heating gas gets split three ways. So first, the LDC gets their cut for operating the local distribution network, which I show here in the diagram on the right. Second, the drillers get their price of the commodity gas. And last, the interstate pipelines involved get a top transportation fee. Now, this is what Penn East is, pro is uh, proposing under those LDCs. Basically, they're going to replace the existing pipelines that are already in the ground owned by other companies with this new Penn East pipeline, which is owned by them. In this scenario, the LDCs take the pipeline transport fees that are currently paying out to other companies, pay it to themselves, plus they get the FERC 14% rate of return guaranteed. Now there's lots of issues here. There's no public benefit for the project at all. FERC did not do any sort of balancing test for Penn East. They simply accepted their list of self-dealing precedent agreements and did not weigh them against community impacts or domain impacts at all. This is all just about growth stories for Wall Street and profit. Uh, since the, the application was approved, Penn East has used eminent domain on 200 properties, and in New Jersey specifically, fully 50% of the route was taken via condemnation. And all of this has happened fundamentally because the Natural Gas Act is flawed and must be reformed. So in summary and conclusion, the fatal flaws of the NGA are enabling FERC to act as a road agency, which does not have to follow its own written policies. The NGA and FERC have enabled countless pipelines like Penn East to be built strictly to get a 14% rate of return. The self-dealing contracts that are being used here should never be allowable as proof of need. An eminent domain must not be allowed for projects that show no public benefit. Put simply, the Natural Gas Act needs to be reformed to stop these abuses. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mike. That was really helpful for explaining why Natural Gas Act, our, our Natural Gas Act reform number six is so essential. And now we're gonna to go to the final reform that we are highlighting, Natural Gas Act reform number seven, which is that the Natural Gas Act needs to be reformed to prohibit the use of tolling orders that allow projects to proceed with eminent domain and construction while legal challengers, challengers are left in legal limbo for many months and or years. Um, and just, it is essential while there has been activity on this in the courts and at FERC itself, we believe that Congress needs to step in and to act. And to really explain why this reform is so essential, we're gonna hear from David Mucklow, lead attorney and counsel for the coalition to reroute the Nexus pipeline. David? Hey, thank you for this opportunity to speak uh, today. Uh, my name is David Mucklow and I'm an attorney from Ohio with 33 years of experience in the federal courts. I represented many property owners in the Nexus Pipeline case, which is an export pipeline moving natural gas from Kensington, Ohio to the Dawn Hub in Ontario, Canada. Nexus is a company controlled by Enbridge, which is a Canadian company. The issues of tolling orders, eminent domain, and initiating construction on a pipeline project are intertwined. Challenging a pipeline project or any aspect of it is an administrative process under the jurisdiction of FERC. Once an application has been filed for a pipeline, stakeholders, stakeholders are compelled to only file pleadings on the FERC docket, which requires extensive legal expertise. Once FERC approves the pipeline, interveners must appeal to a federal appellate court in order to seek redress. The courts have uniformly held that no other remedy is available in the federal courts until after a request for rehearing has been fully litigated and determined by FERC. FERC, however, in order to delay jurisdiction by the federal appellate courts, created a rule not specifically authorized by Congress to toll the 30-day period in which it must decide requests for rehearing. This rule was effectively overturned in June 2020 in the Allegheny Defense Project decision by the U.S. D.C. Court of Appeals. Simultaneously with that decision, FERC issued order number 871 on June 9, 2020 that stays construction during a request for rehearing. The order, however, does not toll the eminent domain proceedings or rules 65 and 71.1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. 
FERC defers to rules established by PIMSA on most construction related issues such as safety. If the pipeline design, design complies with PIMSA rules, which allow siting of pipelines within close proximity to homes, schools, and businesses, the pipeline is deemed safe and the application is granted. These pipelines are high pressure and are extremely dangerous. The federal courts uniformly allow Rule 65 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure to issue an affirmative injunction to allow access and construction of the pipeline. While the imminent demand case is ongoing and no compensation has been awarded or paid to property owners, FERC's new Order 871 does not address this paradox in the law. Property owners must hire their own attorneys and are forced to attend mediation over and over again until they settle their case despite age or health conditions. This is occurring before any appellate court has decided whether the condemnation proceeding should have been authorized in the first instance. The courts are unempathetic and hostile to defendants and their needs based upon my experience. In short, there are limited procedures to stay the eminent domain proceeding. Rule 71.1 of the civil rules does not allow motions to dismiss. Stay orders are extremely rare. FERC itself has only denied an application for a pipeline on a couple of rare occasions since its inception only to later grant the application. It claims that its process is flawless. However, there is a revolving door from industry to agency and the rules are in flux. The issues before FERC are complicated. FERC is not a neutral and openly takes sides with the applicants during the litigation process. Frequently, litigants must respond and reply to multiple sets of pleadings filed by the applicant and its attorneys, and then those filed by FERC. The property owners must bear this enormous expense to fight on the FERC docket, pursue a request for a rehearing, a subsequent appeal, not to mention the eminent domain proceeding. FERC contends that foreign companies are authorized under the Natural Gas Act to use eminent domain to benefit the owners of these foreign companies, even when most of the benefit inures to foreign companies, its shareholders, and governments. This is what occurred in the Nexus case which is still pending in the courts. FERC sees no limitations in the Fifth Amendment as to what constitutes a public use. Congress must address this issue immediately before it is too late for American property owners. Many other issues became apparent to me that the process was rigged in favor of the applicant. If a property owner resists, they're either sued repeatedly or harassed with law enforcement tactics. My experience on the Nexus gas case has led me to believe that FERC must be dismantled and reformed and the Natural Gas Act amended in order to protect property owners. FERC is not a neutral agency operating for the benefit of American citizens, but rather operating for the interests of fossil fuel companies, its shareholders, and political affiliates. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, David. That was really a, a terrific wrapping um, piece of testimony. Um, again, just to remind folks that we actually have 10 critical reforms we're highlighting as part of this briefing, and you'll get information about them in the follow-up materials. But we really now would like to um, provide an opportunity for questions and answers. We want to prioritize congressional representatives and their staff that have joined with us here today. So if we know that you're a member of a congressional office, you're actually being bumped up in this webinar to panelist status. So if you wanted to ask your questions live, you could do so. Just do the raise hand feature and I'll call on you and you can ask your question live. Otherwise, put your questions in the Q&A. And again, if you're from a congressional office, please indicate that so we can be sure to pull your questions out and prioritize them. I understand that we're at the hour mark or just over. So before we go to q and I just wanna thank everybody for joining us. Um, we really look forward to working with you to reform the Natural Gas Act in order to restore needed protections and integrity to the FERC review and approval process. So with that, I'm gonna stop the share and um, start to look for any raised hands or any questions in the Q&A box. Let me get up my participants. And we will, um, you know, we will be taking questions from non-congressional offices, but um, again, wanna prioritize them. And just a kind um, thank you in the Q&A from Rosemary Wessel to thank members of Congress who joined us either to, to view or participate. That was really fantastic. Okay. All right, so it seems like we're not seeing questions in the Q&A and I don't see any raised hands. 
Um, I will um, go to the chat to see if there are any there, but otherwise I think it just makes clear that I think our PowerPoint and our um, testifiers did an awesome job really making the case that needed to be made today. Karen, have you noticed any questions in the chat while we've been going? There was one in the Q&A that we answered, but I wanted to raise it in case anybody wanted to comment. And that was, um, shouldn't these commissioners be called out by name? And I know there are some differing opinions about that, given that some of them are new, but I just wanted to throw that out for comment since uh, it was asked and nobody had a chance to see it since we answered it. <laughs> it, it there's only five of them. You know, we all know who they are and we know what they're doing. And some of them are doing better than others. And I don't think we need to waste our time doing that. And I'll write on that in that uh, the research that uh, Representative Raskin uh, pulled forth uh, within his uh, oversight committee is that this is ongoing. This has been 20 years worth of activity. So, you know, the, the commissioners turn over, but the policy stays the same. Uh, so it doesn't really necessarily matter who it is. Uh, it, it's just a common practice of work. And I would just like to add, um, I think Adam said that very well, and just also add that while we are seeing um, some better conversation around tolling orders and climate change under the current leadership of Commissioner Glick, we're not actually seeing a change in decision making, right? And, um, and so we are continuing to see these projects get lots of maybe better lip service, but they are still advancing. And of course, under a change of leadership, everything can roll back, even if there are enhancements. And that's why we're saying Congress needs to step in and all of these reforms and others need to actually be added to the Natural Gas Act. Um, Richard Shingles asks, and I don't know that we can really answer that. Um, so maybe if uh, there are members of Senate staff or congressional staff um, in um, still on, you can answer that. But he wants to know who in the Senate supports this agenda. And Richard, I think that that's just from the Voices Coalition perspective, this has really been one of our concerns. We have for six years now been advocating for these reforms as well as some others. We chose to highlight these 10 today. And we really have not seen much leadership out of Congress, except from Congressman Raskin, Congresswoman Berrigan. We've seen some, we've seen some progress and, and help from um, Congressman Pallone as well, but we haven't seen the type of progress that's really essential in embracing this, um, this agenda and these changes. Any other panelists want to offer um, any words on that front? Okay, so this one's going to be for Mike Spilly and perhaps Karen and myself, uh, because it's about the Penn East pipeline. Can you comment on the Penn East case heard at the Supreme Court last week? Mike, would you like to say a few words about that first? Yeah, so it, it, it's a very interesting and complicated case, and, and some aspects of it are very, very unfortunate. Uh, you know, basically, the, the court heard oral arguments uh, from Penn East lawyers from uh, the Solicitor General, uh, their, their lawyers, uh, as well as from the state of New Jersey. And the justices were fairly hard on, on both sides. So there was a lot of questions asked. And I think a lot of people think everything is conservative versus liberal. This is one of those interesting cases where there's property rights involved. So it may not be the same alliances that you think are happening there. But I think nobody really knows which way it's going to go. It, I will comment that it was disappointing that Biden's solicitor, acting solicitor general, supported the Trump administration's uh, policy on this and took it perhaps a little further in further support of FERC. I would have liked to see something a little bit more critical of the FERC process than what we saw. Karen, did you wanna add a few words? Um, no, I'm good. I think Mike did a great job. <laughs> I just want to add that one of the one of the reforms that the Voices Coalition has advanced on the property rights front, we didn't choose to highlight it in this briefing because of the Supreme Court case, but we actually believe that Congress should um, step in and reform the Natural Gas Act to, to affirmatively make clear that FERC does not have power of eminent domain authority over lands in which the state has property rights. We think that that's a critical reform, um, and we have put that forth multiple times um, so, you know, we'll wait to see what happens at the Supreme Court level, but it would be appropriate for Congress to step in on that front as well. Um, so uh, Richard Shingles asks, 
Where is Joe Manchin on the need to reform FERC? So is there anybody who would like to speak to that question on our panel? I guess I'll try to wing that one since I'm West Virginian. I know Joe real well. Um, Joe's heavily invested in fossil fuels. He's not, I think he's can be moderate on that. And like our Senator Capito, I haven't given up on him, on Joe, on, on the Congressman or the Senate, Senator Manchin, and I actually sent uh, a uh, link to his staffer in Charleston. It will be difficult for Joe to uh, go against the people that pay a lot of his campaign contributions, but I think it's possible. Maybe not likely, but possible. Uh, we just got to work on him. Great, thank you, Maury. And we we actually have, there is recent news that actually um, Senator Manchin has been, before reforms are, reforms are put in place, is actually urging approval of a number of pipeline projects that have already been advanced, asserting that equity demands that they be allowed to go forth under the old rules. We wholeheartedly disagree. The people in the environment have been placed, and future generations, have been placed at a disadvantage for decades and decades and decades, right? Um, and as uh, um, Irene made very, very clear, um, and the Voices Coalition has made very, very clear since our inception, FERC is a rubber stamp and the rules of the road have never been fair. And so at this point, we need equity restored, frankly, before any other pipelines can receive FERC certification. We think Senator Manchin is, is wrong on this issue um, and needs to come around. Um, so there are some questions about activist next steps. I'm gonna leave that for our Voices Coalition meetings and follow up. Um, bye Maury, thank you for joining. Um, citizens resisting FERC injustices and working to meet the urgent facts of climate change are tired. Is our energy better spent lobbying Congress than participating in the internal FERC reform process um, is the latter showboating. That's from Kay Ferguson. Is I certainly have a defined uh, perspective on that, but perhaps other panelists do, and I'd like to give you the opportunity to go first. I'd certainly say, you know, this is Mike speaking. I, I would certainly say that, you know, while it's good to see FERC potentially reforming to a degree, I am worried that is basically new curtains on the Titanic, that they're just basically doing, you know, let's look a little bit better. Let's get better publicity for ourselves. But in reality, anyone who's been through the ringer of the FERC process knows that it is entirely slanted against everyone except pipeline companies. So I hold out some hope, but when you talk about prioritizing where your efforts are going to go, and yeah, we're, we're all tired. I've been doing penny stalling for six years, and I'm not even anywhere near the longest. So, you know, if you want to prioritize, I think looking at the congressional angle and getting the laws fixed would probably be your number one priority because FERC really feels like a bit of a forlorn hope, even with, with Commissioner Glick and other there, others there. And I'll just, jump into, oh, sorry, go ahead, Garrett. I just really wanted to quickly add that um, if you look at what's happening now, anything that's happened in the way of progress is congressionally mandated. They're not doing it on their own. And so that's where the, uh, that's where the impetus needs to come from. Congress needs to act to make FERC do things better. Adam? Well, and alongside Congress, the litigation, uh, the DC Circus kind of putting them in their place and telling them what exactly the statutes require. But uh, turning focus to FERC's opening of the notice of inquiry regarding their certificate policy and how they permit gas infrastructure, they are soliciting responses from the general public uh, as to how they can better perform these duties and comply with NEPA and the Natural Gas Act and a variety of other environmental laws. Um, and Commissioner Glick, through many of his dissents in the past, uh, has really expressed an interest in making sure that the full gamut of indirect emissions and impacts are fully accounted for. And I don't have any reason to fully discount him on that uh, and his, uh, his genuine nature on this. Uh, that said, I think some of the reason that we've been seeing many of the same decisions still be the same, despite some lip service, is because the commission still has not turned over despite the administration doing so. Uh, Biden will have his final appointee uh, to round out the, the three Democrats on the commission until sometime later this summer. And so right now he's trying to find a consensus ground uh, between being chairman and trying to get Neil Chatterjee to meet him in the middle. Uh, 
so that's why some of the the on the ground difference is not quite the same, but it does look like there is some indication that there might be changes to the certificate policy. Um, but at this point, it, it's still speculative as to where they might shake out. And I just like to finally add that, you know, we, we you know, FERC, FERC has been in operation for decades. Um, and, and while there may at times have been better lip service here and there, including currently, we actually aren't seeing changes on the ground. We aren't seeing progress from FERC as a whole. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a Democratic administration, a Republican administration, a pro-environment, or an anti-environment administration. The pipeline companies always get their way when they go before FERC. And that's why it's always been a rubber stamp and it's still a rubber stamp. And of course, any modifications that might come under better leadership um, now or in the future can be rolled back just as easily as they've been rolled forward. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I am very concerned that it's window dressing. Um, and I think that that Kay's comment, is it just showboating? Significantly, <laughs> um, in my opinion, yes, it is. Whether it's um, by design or not, whether there's good intent behind it or not, I think the ultimate reality is going to be the same. Pipelines are, continue, are going to continue to be rolled out. People are going to continue to be rolled. And so too are the environments going to be rolled over and plowed under. Um, and that's why we need Congress to step in and we need Natural Gas Act reform. I think with that, we're at a quarter past the hour. Um, almost all of our attendees stayed on for the entire time. So I just think that, you know, that, that that's a testament to their dedication to change and to the great job that our testifiers did and that our Voices Coalition has done in organizing this congressional briefing. We look forward to continuing to work with you um, and to truly secure meaningful change so we can protect our environment, secure true environmental justice, address the climate crisis, advance renewable energy, protect our environment, protect people's rights, protect states' rights, and truly make a change when it comes to FERC. Thank you, everybody, for joining our congressional briefing.